Welcome, Phil Mayer. Hello. <laughs> Phil, thanks a lot for joining us at the Data Journalism Conference. Uh, this is kind of a keynote at the end of the day and not at the beginning of the day, because that would have been in the middle of the night for you. It's 10 o'clock in the morning now for you, isn't it? Yes, and I do appreciate that adjustment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. We do it a lot. It's four in the afternoon. Phil, uh, Phil is a professor emeritus at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. But Phil, first of all, uh, was a journalist. He started his, his career, as I reread here now, again in 1944, which is if I may say so, quite a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> This is true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he had a career uh, at Knight Ritter, which was the second largest newspaper company, is that true? In the United States, yeah? yeah. Until it uh, was sold in 2000, like, I don't know, 2009 or 2008? Somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, and he, he studied and talked political science. Um, and he was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University in 1966-67 and he received several awards. Maybe you can tell us some about that. He is the author of The Vanishing Newspaper and he published his memoir last year, Paper Root, Finding My Way to Precision Journalism. I mentioned the Neiman Fellow at Harvard University because when you came back you did one of your pieces that became very famous about the Detroit riots, which was a very early example of computer-assisted reporting. And uh, I think you told me once that you were inspired by your studies at Harvard to do that piece. Maybe you will also tell us something about that. Um, Phil, please add, if I forgot something, that is important in your biogra biography. And then I will stop talking because we want to listen to you. Thanks again very much. Thank you, Daniela. And your summary of my biography was perfect. I don't have a thing to add or subtract from it. And so let me just start out by, by giving advice, uh, which is what I seem to do best in my, in, at this stage of my life. If you are new to data journalism, you might be preoccupied with the mechanics of computing and that will have a couple of effects, some good, some bad. It can greatly expand the possibilities that you see for journalism and it also can lead you into some, some traps. So I'm going to talk about the, both the good stuff and, and the bad stuff. But first a couple of basics. Journalism for most of the last hundred years has been interested not only in gathering facts and letting them speak for themselves, but also in the explanation of the facts. I have here in my hand the journalism textbook that I used in college. It's Interpretative Reporting by Curtis McDougall, who was a professor at Northwestern University. He called it Interpretative Reporting because his point was that the facts alone are not enough. It's often the pattern that the facts form that contain the real story. And so if a journalist just prevents, pre presents the facts and then expects the public to do the interpretation, that's not enough. You've got to do the interpretation uh, to, to assist the reader. And there are two basic ways of doing interpretation. One is narrative journalism, where you arrange the facts in a way that shows the pattern. And the other is by applying scientific method. And that was the main thing I learned at, in my Harvard year, was not C computing was one of the things I learned, but it was scientific method that was the main thing. And the computing was just an end to using scientific method. So I, I have three main points about using data sets in journalism. And the first one is your very first stage of your investigation should be to investigate your own data set. Where did it come from? Who gathered the data? For what purpose? What motives might they have had in mind that you're not aware of. Even official sources ought to be tested by choosing some random cases to investigate with old-fashioned shoe leather methods. I recall a case some years ago when I was advising USA Today and their environmental reporter got a really good database 
that showed the reports of various factories on the chemicals and the amounts of chemicals that they disposed of in, 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 in streams. And they, it was easy enough to rank them and find the most extreme polluter. Now that's a very tempting thing, is to find the extreme cases. At one meeting of investigative journalists, I heard a reporter describe the normal distribution, you know, the bell-shaped curve. And then he pointed to the tails of the curve and said, that's where the news is, in the outliers. That's not true, because usually the outliers get there through measurement error of some kind. If you see extreme cases, your first thought should be, wow, that's extreme, that's news. Your first thought should be, what happened that caused that case, and could it be an error? In USA Today's case, they found a well-known company that was the most extreme polluter by far, and we sent a reporter to interview that company and to go down the back trail of the data to see how it was collected. And right away they discovered a, a transcription error, a coding error, a systematic coding error that misstated the units of, of the polluting chemical so that it was really not an outlier at all. It was just an error. If we had gone straight into the paper with that story, we would have been terribly embarrassed. So the old uh, expression, if your mother says she loves you, check it out, applies to data journalism. And it's important to stress that because when you first start using a computer and this wonderful data comes out, you think, this is beautiful and a computer gave it to me, therefore it must be perfect. No, because remember, human beings created the data that went in and as we one of the oldest expressions in the computer business is garbage in, garbage out. And so you have to check on how it, it went in. And I, I can think of one other example of the problem of, of, of focusing on outliers. A, a reporter at one of the meetings I attended years ago was very proud of the fact that he had identified the drunkest driver in his state. He got a database that showed drunk driving arrests and in the United States, there is a legal limit of the amount of alcohol you can have in your blood. And if you are arrested for suspected drug driving, they will usually test you to find out what is the exact proportion of alcohol in your blood. And so he used that data to find and identify the drunkest driver in the state and interview him. Well, there might have been error in that. Uh, there's not much public value in finding and interviewing the drunkest driver. Turned out he was kind of proud of it. And uh, that, I think that's a poor, a poor uh, application of database journalism. The other way to validate your data is to search for impossible combinations. That will give you a sense of how dirty the data really are. For example, if it's survey research, you could look for persons under the age of 20 who have advanced degrees in college. Uh, that would raise a red flag that... Uh, something is wrong with the data. Now, there might be somebody who is 18 years old who has a PhD, but if the computer tells you that, don't take it at face value. Go look at that case, find that person, and see if it's really so. My second point is that we need to know how to collect our own data, rather than always relying on what government or other agencies give us. There are still a lot of records that are kept only in paper, but those records can be sampled and converted to a manageable electronic set. When I was helping Don Barlett and Jim Steele at the Philadelphia Inquirer many years ago, they did a landmark study of fairness in the criminal justice system, and all of the records were on paper. So I helped them work out a method for sampling them so that you could generalize to the whole set of data from a fairly small manageable sample that we could then enter into uh, a, a, a digital format and analyze with the computer. And that worked out pretty well. It, it drew a lot of attention, it led to a lot of imitations. It was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize and it was rejected because one juror said, they didn't play fair, they used a computer, that's not fair. Uh, it, was a, it reminded me of the time when the, the aluminum pole made it possible to set world records in pole vaulting, and there was controversy over whether that should be allowed. Well, now that computers are more common, it's, 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 that's not a barrier anymore. 
but that shows how far how far ahead of their time bonnet and steel were. The, you can also generate data through uh, journalistic field experiments, public opinion research, and I really like field experiments because they're just inherently interesting. I got a lot of ideas from Stanley Milgram, who was an experimental psychologist and did some very famous experiments, one of which, one of the te techniques he invented was called the lost letter method. And my students and I applied this in, uh, in, in Chapel Hill. Now, we live in a university town, but it's close by two other universities that we are highly competitive with, both academically and in athletics, Duke University and North Carolina State University. And so we addressed letters to fictitious post office, uh, fictitious names, but to real post office boxes. And we wrote in pencil on the letter, found near a car, stamped them, and then left them under the windshield wipers of cars in parking lots at our university, at Duke University, at North Carolina State University. And you see what we were testing here was helping behavior. What proportion of the letters would be taken to the post office by whoever found them so that they would get to their intended destination? And because of the rivalry among the schools, it was really, really interesting. And the TV news people had a lot of fun with it. We found that there was no difference in helpfulness between North Carolina State and Chapel Hill uh, finders of the letter, but there was much less helping behavior at Duke. And uh, that made a pretty good story right there because Duke has a reputation of being kind of a, a, an elite school. Most of its students come from the North and it's very expensive. And so that gave us some North Carolina loyalists a certain amount of satisfaction. However, that leads me to my third point, which is when you infer causation, you have to be very, very careful and consider rival hypotheses. In this case, the, we had anticipated a rival hypothesis. We had anticipated that Duke might be different. And so we took the precaution of when we left the letters under the windshield wipers of the cars in the parking lots at the three universities, we also noted the license tag of the car. And then in the analysis stage, we could hold the variable, was it in-state or out-of-state, constant. And so when we analyzed them separately, looked at only in-state cars, we found that Duke was every bit as helpful as NC State and as UNC at Chapel Hill. It turned out that the non-helping behavior, the antisocial activity, was all from those Yankees who came from up north, mostly from New Jersey. And, of course, that made news by itself, too. That was a good story. So it, it illustrates the advantage of generating your own data. Field experiments are a lot of fun. And you still have to know the statistical tools for discovering spurious causation. Now, when I teach reporting, I teach how to do correlation analysis. And I also teach the students that correlation does not by itself prove causation. And many throw up their hands and say, whoopee, correlation is useless because it doesn't prove causation. Therefore, we don't have to bother to learn it. Well, no. Uh, causation is, uh, correlation is evidence of causation. It's just not convincing evidence. And you have to check out other possibilities. But there are tools for doing that. And uh, there are, uh, and I'll discuss ways to do that in, in a minute. But, but first let me explain, give you just a short list of, of some really important statistical tools that you ought to learn if you're going to use data. One of them is sampling. I said we sampled paper records. And I've encountered lots of cases where that was the only way to get the story to do database analysis is to take paper records, sample them, and then enter them manually into the computer and then do the analysis. Well, the basic rule for sampling is that each unit of the population being studied must have a known chance of being included in the sample. It's easier if you give each unit an equal chance. 
then the statistics for figuring the margin of error are quite straightforward, and you can get them in any statistics textbook, and, and, and in my book, uh, Precision Journalism, of course. The, the other question that always comes up is, how big a sample do you need? And often reporters will call me and say, I need to know how big the sample should be, and then they start describing the size of the population and the accuracy they need, and I always interrupt, interrupt them, and I say, 384. 384 is the sample size you need in an infinitely large population to achieve an error margin of plus or minus five percentage points. So if you could just remember that one number, 384, and shoot for a sample of that size, you'll be in pretty good shape most of the time. Okay, now, m m moving on to, uh, to correlation. Let me give you a couple of examples where s simple-minded correlation analysis has led people astray. In the 1968 presidential election in the United States, George Wallace, w the governor of Alabama, was running for president on a third-party ticket that opposed racial desegregation. The Supreme Court had ordered desegregation in our public schools. George Wallace was against it. He promised to stand in the schoolhouse door to stop it. And that made him popular in some places in the American South. And he felt confident enough to run for president on a third party ticket. Well, analysis of the election returns showed an interesting thing. In the Deep South, if you analyze at the county level, the greater the percent African-American in the county, the higher the vote for George Wallace. And some people leap to the conclusion from that, look, black people really are against integration. They like George Wallace because the more black people there are in the county, the greater the vote for George Wallace. This is an example of what we call the ecological fallacy. That is generalizing from group data to the individuals within those groups. And on further inspection, it turned out that the reason that George Wallace's vote was higher in the high black counties was that the high proportion of blacks made the white minority, or, or made the whites especially uptight and, and nervous. The second important thing was that the vote was systematically denied to blacks through intimidation and other methods. They just didn't vote. And so it really wasn't black people voting for Wallace that gave it, that yielded those numbers. So the, uh, uh, another example would be um, Samuel Stouffer's study of morale in the United States Army in World War II. He found that in units with high promotion rates, morale was low. In units with low promotion rates, morale was high. Why in the world would that be? Well, that led to a new theory called relative deprivation. And it turned out that in the high promotion rate units, for everyone who got promoted, there were a large number of people who were frustrated at not being promoted. When everybody was in the same boat and nobody got promoted, the unit was actually happier and higher morale than the units where there was, there was high promotion. Again, if you take the face value conclusion, you're falling into the ecological fallacy. The, um, another case was when Jimmy Carter was running for president. One of his key characteristics was his religiosity. He was a church-going Baptist who talked about his religion a lot. Uh, he expressed many political issues in moral terms, and everybody assumed that this was helping him with churchgoers. Then the Gallup poll published a, a story showing that churchgoers were no more likely to vote for Jimmy Carter than non-churchgoers. The conclusion was that Jimmy Carter's religiosity was not helping him at all. Well, it just happened that that election, I had access to my own data. My employer, Knight Ritter, let me run my own national poll, and so I could do direct analysis of the data, and I could test for an alternate hypothesis. My hypothesis was this. Jimmy Carter drew disproportionately from young people. He was a fresh face. Young voters are much more likely to vote for him than older voters. But paradoxically, younger voters are much less religious than older voters. 
So the youth effect canceled out the religion effect. But if you looked at voters separately by age category, then within each category of age, the churchgoers were more likely to vote for Jimmy Carter. So religion did have an effect. It was helping him. It was just, it was just that you couldn't see it in the simple distributions, the simple cost tabs. Now, there are many ways you can be led astray by third variables like that. The third variable in this case being a, the age of, of the respondent. And so you have to learn how to look for those. And in your analysis, you have to learn how to control for third factors. There are ways to do it with correlation analysis. You can also do it with cost tabulation. I like correlation better because you can get more information out of smaller sample sizes. But the bottom line is, and this is the, uh, the, the, the moral of my talk, and, and, and this is a, all I'll have to say in, until we, we get to the question period, that knowing how to ask a question of the data isn't enough. You have to know how to ask a question of the data without being fooled by the answer. And that's where scientific method comes in. And that's why knowing scientific method to seek the meaningful pattern in the facts is as important as knowing how to write a good narrative. And so that's the, that's the summary of my advice. That's such a good summary, you don't even have to buy my book now. But it's okay if you do anyway. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Um, sure. Your talk ties in very well with the first workshop that we're going to have tomorrow on data literacy and basic statistics with Nicolas Kaiser Brill. Um, I would like, we would like to ask you a few questions given that you've been working um, in this field since the early days of computer assisted reporting. Um, so we would like to know your view on what things have changed and what things have stayed the same throughout your career until uh, present times in this area of um, using data for reporting, whether it's called computer-assisted reporting or data journalism? Well, the main thing that has changed in my career, of course, has been the, the technology. Computers are becoming far more useful, much faster, and much, much cheaper. The first computer that I used was an IBM 7090. It took up a... It, it wouldn't fit in this room where I'm sitting now. It, it was so big. Its core memory was less than the memory in your cell phone. And because of that small memory, it needed lots of input and output operations. So it had 10 tape drives. And that was kind of interesting because you could see from the pattern of the tape drives whether your program was working or not. And because the computer was so expensive, it meant that jobs had to be batched. You would punch your program into cards, into IBM cards. And, uh, and, and that's a really old technology. The punch card goes back to uh, pre-war days. In fact, when I was in college, when at registration time, we would enter our information, writing around the little holes in the punch cards. And you would take it to the computer center, leave it to be bashed with other jobs, and come back several hours later to see what kind of output you got. If you got a thin stack, that meant your program didn't work and the thin stack would contain one or more error messages. The computer was programmed with hundreds of different ways to insult you, and but each insult carried a clue to what you did wrong. If you got back a thick stack of paper, your heart left with joy because that meant the computer took your request seriously and gave you back information. And at one point during my Neiman year, I was so proud of getting a stack this thick that I took it to a, a dinner that the Neiman fellows were having, and I spread it across the floor to show how much information I had gotten with just a few simple questions. And uh, one of my colleagues, David Hoffman of the New York Cal Tribune, said, package that and sell it. And uh, that's what I did, and that was really the birth of, uh, of precision journalism. So I would say technology was the main thing. The other thing that changed was it, it was very slow to get the idea of precision journalism. It, it took me a long time to get it accepted because the computer was so difficult to access. The only reason I was able to do it was that I blundered into a course at Harvard where they were teaching one of the very first statistical 
software programs. You could learn to write code, and it was easier than SAS code. It, it was a program called Harvard Data Text. Uh, it's, it's no longer, I don't, I don't know of anyone who uses it now. And, uh, but it was something like SPSS. And it was, but, but, but the book uh, was, was this thick. It took a long time to learn. And most reporters weren't willing to go to that trouble. And it really wasn't until the personal computer came along with its spreadsheets and its uh, database programs, like uh, I remember one called Paradox and the now Microsoft Access, that makes it much easier, and it makes the entry price of getting into computer-assisted journalism much lower. And then that stimulates the interest of people who are then ready to learn more difficult stuff. And look at the number of people in, in, in the room where you are now. It shows that, that it's becoming quite accepted and quite mainstream. But getting there uh, took a long time, and uh, it, uh, it took a good deal of development in, in technology. Thank you. Um, another question would be, I am not sure how much you follow the conversation around uh, data journalism uh, these days, but we were wondering uh, what do you see is distinctive about data journalism uh, today compared to previous practices of using data for reporting? Okay, something has happened to the sound here, and I didn't quite understand that. Maybe if you got a little closer yeah, to the I'll, microphone. Yeah, I'll try one more time. So, uh, we were wondering what do you see as distinctive about data journalism today in comparison with other previous practices uh, that involve the use of data for reporting? If I'm not sure how much you've been following the conversation around data journalism these days, but you are right that it's becoming quite okay. mainstream. Yes, yeah, I'm the wrong guy to ask about that because wonderful things are happening that I don't understand. Most of them are on the side of uh, presentation, and that's another important use of computer-assisted journalism, is putting the data in forms that are easy to understand. So the, uh, the statistical graphics, for example, and lots of interesting things are being done that I had thought about in the past but, but didn't know how to do. For example, you can now do statistical presentations that move. And if you have the advantage of color and moving pictures and sometimes even three-dimensional presentation, you, you can get information into the reader's head much more easily than you could uh, before. The other thing that's new is that there are now tools for doing really energetic, powerful exploratory research. Uh, exploratory research is using the statistical power of the computer to grab the data by the throat and say, speak to me, and, and it does. Uh, the, the earliest form of that was factor analysis, which combs through a number of variables and looks for commonalities so that you can see patterns of a smaller number of variables that will tell you the same story in an easier way. And there are now tools for, for doing that. Cluster analysis is one of the, the early ones. And those tools are powerful, and of course they're dangerous, because they tempt you into finding out stuff that you, before you fully understand it. So you have to learn not only how to use those tools, you have to learn what they mean. And that used to be the subject of a big debate in factor analysis. Statisticians used to say it's immoral to use a computer for factor analysis unless you've done one by hand first, because only when you've done it by hand can you fully understand it. Well, that's a pretty high barrier, because uh, the, uh, the first use of factor analysis in an academic publication was in the American Political Science Review, and it took the authors a couple of years to crunch the data. And so I, trust me, I never bothered to, to uh, do one by hand, but I did become fairly uh, comfortable with doing it with, with a computer. And I think there are many more things like that being developed today, of which I am only dimly aware and not an expert on at all. But as the computers find more and more powerful tools like that, you have to be more and more careful. 
very early in the computer era, there was a cartoon that was posted at one of the computer centers that I worked, where I did my work. And its motto was, to err is human, to really screw up takes a computer. And uh, that's one thing to remember. The computer can allow you to do really, really important things, and it can allow you to make mistakes of a magnitude that was not possible before. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Do you have any questions, comments, other things you want to say to Phil? Okay. Great. Then um, I have another question. Uh, we spoke today in in the previous sessions um, on the one uh, hand about how journalists can become equipped with the skills they need to work with data and on the other hand uh, about how to convince decision makers in newsrooms to support data operations. And we were wondering um, how, how did you convince the newsrooms that you worked for to, to do computer assisted reporting and what could we learn from that? You know, I was really lucky. Uh, my luck was good because a lot of other people had, had bad luck. I came out of uh, Harvard looking for ways to show the, the power of the tools that I had just learned. And that was the summer of 67, which happened to be the year that the Detroit riot happened. Uh, race relations was at a critical time in the United States, partly because of the civil rights movement and the national government's response to it. And the first sign of really serious trouble had come two years earlier in 1965 in the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles when there had been a riot with deaths and injuries and much property damage. And there was great concern across the United States whether that was going to signal a new phase in race relations. Then things were quiet for a year and then the Detroit riot happened. And because I happened to be the one in the office to answer the phone when the editor called for more reporters to come help cover the story, I got to go and, and cover that story by traditional means. And then at the end of the week, by the time the National Guard and the federal troops had quieted the riot, I proposed we do a survey using social science research methods to get at the basic causes of the riot. And I got the idea from some professors at the University of California who had done such a survey for the Watts riot, except they were just publishing theirs the same week that the riot in Detroit happened. It took them two years to collect, analyze, and publish that data. And I said, we can use this as an example, but we're newspaper men, not professors. It took them two years. We can do it in three weeks. And the editor said, write me a memo. And so I did and got some help from the uh, University of Michigan. Uh, I hired some social scientists to, to help walk me through the steps. And that story attracted so much attention and brought so much favorable publicity to my employer, Night Newspapers, which at that time was a much smaller group. I think it had about six or seven newspapers then. And the, uh, but, but, but the, the company management was so pleased with the public response to it that they pretty much gave me a free hand to follow up with other projects like that. And so instead of being a purely Washington reporter, I became a roving reporter. And where social unrest happened anywhere around the country where we had a newspaper, I would parachute in and apply these methods and, uh, and cover it in ways it could not be covered before. Now, the newspaper business then was much different than it is to today. Newspapers were natural monopolies, and they made money automatically. Uh, whether you put out a good newspaper or a bad newspaper, it still made money. And so newspapers competed more on pride rather than on profit. 
And this innovative work that we were doing was a source of pride for the publisher. And that was one reason that uh, I got the freedom to do the, the things that I did. That's uh, what led to the publication of Precision Journalism because the work itself attracted attention. And that created a market for people who wanted to do this work them themselves. And that meant that uh, eventually we would find a market for, for the book, uh, Precision Journalism. Now, even so, it was a hard sell at first because the idea of journalists using scientific method seemed pretty radical. And uh, that's another long story in, in itself. Um, and I hope I haven't drifted too far away from, from your original question. But uh, if, uh, if you want, I can tell you about a little bit about the process of, uh, of selling the idea as something that any journalist can learn how to do. It would be useful to have a few words on that. Okay. I, in, in my uh, book, uh, the title show backwards on this, I think, but in this book I have a chapter explaining that process. The, a professor at Harvard, Thomas Pettigrew, put me in touch with the Russell Sage Foundation, whose interest at that time was making social sciences better understood. And they saw what I was doing and say, said, here's a reporter who obviously understands social science because he's doing it. If he can teach other reporters how to do that, then it'll be good for social science. And so they offered me a grant to write the book explaining to other reporters how to uh, do what I had not yet learned to call precision journalism. What we called it then was the application of social and behavioral science research methods to the application of journalism. Well, I knew that was a non-starter. You can't sell a book that has a title that long. You can even sell an idea that has a title that long. And eventually, I ran into Eric Guinness at Kansas State University who suggested calling it precision journalism. So I wrote the book uh, on schedule, and then the Russell Sage Foundation sent it around to various people to evaluate, decide whether they should publish it. Under my contract with them, they had the first publication right. And they sent it to friends of the, uh, uh, of the president of the foundation. One of his friends was the page one editor of the Wall Street Journal. And this editor read it and said, I can't see a market for it. Who are you writing it for? Uh, this stuff is way too complicated for reporters. It's way too simple for social scientists. You fall between these two stools. There's nobody who will want to read it. And uh, other uh, readers had pretty much the same reaction. Eventually, uh, Bill Davison, a very smart sociologist at Columbia University, said, if I had this on my shelf right now, I would assign it to my students because it fits perfectly some of the things I'm trying to teach. But, he said, I am a sample of one, and everybody knows you can't generalize from a sample of one. I don't think there are enough other professors like me to make a market for it. So the foundation rejected it, and I had to go find a publisher of my own. And it took me two years. I was rejected five times, usually on the same ground, that it's not social science, it's not journalism, therefore it's not anything, and therefore there's no market for it. And finally, Indiana University, which had a strong journalism school, where I had given a lecture, had a very smart uh, university press manager named John Goldman. And after conferring with the journalism dean there, he agreed to take it on. And so it was finally published in 1973, three years after I had finished writing the book. And it caught on immediately because journalism schools had seen a need for something that bridges that gap between social science and journalism. Journalism schools in the United States were divided between two kinds of people. There was even a nickname for them, the Green Eye Shades and the Chi Squares. The Green Eye Shades were old-time newspaper workers who taught journalism the way they had practiced it. And the Chi Squares were the quantitative academics who did mass communications research, which often had very little practical value. And to get those two groups to talk to each other, <coughs> they needed something like my book, because it found the common ground. And for that reason, the book was a rousing success for an academic book. And for that reason, it's still in print today. Um, this is 2000, 
good account was just 2012, and it was published in 1973. That's not many uh, academic books stay in print that long. Amazing. Um, do we have Is any questions? Hi, good me Mr. Mayor. My name is Lydia, and I work for the Spanish newspaper El País. I have a question for you from a traditional newspaper. We always had this problem when, when we had really good people uh, analyzing data and analyzing information about some specific subject. If you have somebody very good doing this research work in financial, uh, a big bank will come and hire this person for their PR department, so they get two things. One, he won't be writing about those things in a newspaper, and second, he will put this talent at the self of the bank PR department. Now we are seeing that the same thing is happening with the people more skilled to do precision journalism, uh, the people more talented to work with data, with gathering data, analyzing data, and visualizing data. Um, it, at the newsroom, we feel that we don't have as much money or so, such a big resources as big companies to keep them. Could you please give us some advice about how to convince these people to stay with us? Thank you. Well, I can't give you useful advice about your situation because I'm not that familiar with it, but I can tell you what I did when I was in exactly that same situation. Now, even though I was working at a time when newspapers made lots of money, it was hard to get them to respond on short notice to, uh, to projects that needed money. For example, the Detroit survey. We had to go to, the, the managing editor of the Detroit Free Press went to charity to, to get money to, to, to pay for it. And several times throughout my career, I got support for journalism from charitable foundations and from government even. Now, according to standard journalism ethics, that's not allowed. But in each case, the need for the story was so great that we overlooked those constraints and we took the government money or the, uh, the, uh, the foundation money. And so I guess the governing principle is that if the story is important enough, and if the editors want the story badly enough, they will find a way to, to get the money. But you're right, uh, the, the most motivation for doing these kinds of stories is when there's some kind of a crisis, such as social upheaval. And because newspapers like to budget in advance, there is usually nothing in the budget for doing something like that. And so you have to go outside for, for funding. And in my case, uh, foundations and, and government were, were the solution. Uh, let me just tell you about the most outrageous example. The, um, I, I, I wrote a book, I've taught journalism ethics, and so I know a little bit about what's a, a, a allowable. After the Detroit project, I said to the company, you know, it's not right that we waited until there was a riot to learn about the attitudes of African Americans in Detroit. We need to find one of our cities where there has not been a riot. Study African Americans now before problems rise to the point where there is a riot. And so they said, that's a good idea. And so they budgeted money in advance to do a survey in Miami, which has a very large black population. So I did that survey the year after the Detroit survey. This was 1968, taking the, uh, the, the psychological temperature of, of the black population studying their reactions to the civil rights movement, what they thought about Martin Luther King and his nonviolence movement. And I gathered the data, uh, it was very good data, using professional interviewers, and was analyzing it back home in Washington when Martin Luther King was assassinated. Now, that was a tragedy, and as often happens in journalism, tragedy sometimes leads to opportunity because there was widespread curiosity about what King's death would mean to the civil rights movement. And a conventional wisdom narrative quickly developed. 
that the civil that the nonviolent aspect of civil rights would die with Martin Luther King. He was very successful <clears throat> and very vigorous at preaching nonviolence. Now that he was the victim of violence, surely blacks would no longer agree with his philosophy and the violent minority among black activists would become the dominant minority. And I was in a perfect position to test that because we had what we call a pretest, post-test possibility. I had the pretest, and all I had to do was go back and interview the same people again, ask them the same questions, and see how they had changed since Martin Luther King's assassination. It was a, uh, it, I was, one of my beats in Washington was the Office of Economic Opportunity, the, the anti-poverty agency. And I went to talk to one of my sources there, and I told him about this, uh, this opportunity and he said maybe I can find the money for you and sure enough within a matter of days we had a federal grant from one of my sources can you imagine anything less ethical than that taking money from one of your sources to gather news and I took that offer down to my editors in Miami and they jumped on it uh, they said yes we'll, we'll do this they not once did they question the ethics of that because the social need was so great that it overrode everything else. Well, the, the, there's more than the social need, of course. There was also the need for for, for the, the the newspaper to, uh, to 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 be in a position to perform a highly visible public service, and we we did it on on that basis. And since the, and after that, there were a number of cases where I relied on foundation grants and government money to uh, to do the work. Now I don't know what the political and social situation would be in in your countries, and whether you could get away with that. But I found that where charitable foundations are concerned, if they are foundations of good prestige and are not identified with any particular political faction, then you can do it and without being criticized. And so the Russell Page, Sage Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the uh, John and Mary Markle Foundation, foundations that are dedicated to public service and, and improving public knowledge can support you and, 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 and nobody will complain. So you need, when you're doing non-conventional reporting, you sometimes need to look for non-conventional sources of funding. And nowadays, of course, with the media, the traditional media in financial trouble, I think that's even more important. And I think it's even more understandable. I think there would be much less objection to using non-traditional sources of funding. And I, w I wish you well with that. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to add anything related to this or have, has another question? Um, okay, we don't have any more questions from the audience, so I think we can we can end the session here. It's been an honor to have you join us by Skype. Thank you very much, and I'd like to ask the audience to join me in giving a warm thank you to Phil Meyer for joining us via Skype on this conference. It's been my pleasure. Uh, thank, thank you very much, and I wish you the best of luck in your careers.